That's Nick. That's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about the 1995 hit film, Waiting to Exhale, which is based on, of course, on Terry McMillan's 1992 uh, runaway bestseller and stars four uh, incredible ladies. Uh, it was a film that was called A Social Phenomenon by the LA Times because it has a, get this, an all black cast. Uh, so here we are revisiting this film uh, based on poll results for several offerings. That's right. And we have some amazing guests here. We have the ladies from the Diagnosing Sitcoms and Movies podcast, Courtney Copeland, licensed mental health counselor, and Dr. B, licensed professional counselor. Welcome. Hi. Thank you all for having us. Oh, we're so excited to have you here. So we did a podcast episode on your channel. Uh, we reviewed the film Hustle and Flow. We had such a good time. People loved it. Um, <laughs> for people who aren't already subscribed to your podcast, I know you'll want to be by the end of this video. So I'll put a link to that podcast underneath. I'll also put a link to the Hustle and Flow video because I, I think it's really good. <laughs> <laughs> it is. We had so much fun doing that. As are all of your um, uh, podcasts, but Ah, shucks. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I think uh, we should approach this a little differently since we have uh, two very knowledgeable people here. Uh, <laughs> not to discount Nick. I'm, I'm the dummy in the group. But anyway. Not at I thought, all. <laughs> I thought we would do something different and approach the story by telling uh, the stories of each of the four main characters. So like Nick mentioned, it's based on Terry McMillan's novel. This is the IMDb description. This film follows four very different African-American women and their relationships with men. That's basically it. So the four women are Angela Bassett, Whitney Houston, Loretta Devine, and Lila Rashawn. And I think Angela Bassett's character, Bernadine, is probably the, the core of the story. Mm. So I think we should start with her. Okay. So who wants to talk about who Bernadine is? Bernadine was that girl. <laughs> yes. This yes, role is she iconic. Was. I think we mm -hmm. all, I mean, just the imagery of her throwing all of her husband's stuff in that BMW, lighting it on fire <laughs> and walking away. <laughs> that is iconic. I mean, she it was is definitely trash. a badass. Right. Okay. She said yeah. it is trash. <laughs> So they, she lives in Phoenix. I don't know why. I don't think it occurred to me. So I have a history with Phoenix because my mom lived there for many years. But prior to that, I don't think I had an impression of Phoenix the way I do now, which is a very conservative place that's not very open to immigration. So it's funny to me that these four uh, successful Black women find themselves in Phoenix, but because I wouldn't want to stay there. But Bernadine um, has a very nice life in Phoenix. She is married. Who plays her husband, Nick? Michael Beach. Do we know what his firm did? What is this business she built for him? Uh, I wasn't clear about that. I'm just, the only thing I know about it is Kelly Preston is in one scene as his white, his new white lady. Well, we need to get into that. <laughs> but we do, because I don't Can know we what talk? he did. <laughs> <laughs> but that slap. Right. And she just leaves. <laughs> like, right, she just slapped her. She just got out of the way. Like, all right. Like, oh, right. <laughs> I deserved it. Oh. Yeah. yeah, the slap felt very good. Um, but one, like the opening of the film is Angela's getting ready, brushing her hair out, looking fabulous. And mm -hmm. her husband says, do you mind if we don't go to the party? And I felt so bad because the look on her face is like, she thinks they're going to have a nice evening together. Mm -hmm. He's like, actually, I'm taking this other broad. She doesn't want to be alone tonight. And I was just like, oh. <laughs> the audacity. Um, I don't I don't care if that hoe is gonna be alone tonight. I'm sorry. Can I say? Yeah. <laughs> say whatever you want. I'll just be <laughs> hey. yeah. Oh, I yeah. was hot for her. Yes, absolutely. And I mean, she's I mean, it's hard for me to think that someone's gonna like dump Angela Bassett. Like, no, no, not I'm not me would never. Courtney B. Vance would never. Right. I'm so glad you mentioned that because Terry McMillan also wrote How Stella Got Her Groove Back, which we mm -hmm. reviewed on our podcast, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think my issue with that, my biggest issue with that story is I felt like everyone's reaction to Angela Bassett dating Tay Diggs felt weird because she's so fly and perfect. Mm -hmm. It just felt weird that people were like, you're with her? <laughs> I feel it should be the opposite. Like exactly. Wow, you snagged her. Like 
Right. <laughs> and then when it's Kelly Preston, it's like you needed to get somebody like Michelle Pfeiffer if it's going to be the white lady that is <laughs> like Kelly well, Preston. Let's, <laughs> let's talk about that. I mean, that's the big thing about her character, I think, is the pain she feels not only being left for another woman, but mm. the fact that it's a white woman mm. seems to really be an issue for her. And I think I would love to hear other people's perspectives. For, for me, I felt that felt like an extra slap in the face. I don't interpret her character as like she has a problem with white people. It's just mm -hmm. like an extra slap in the face. Like you're leaving me for some bitch at work and she's no, white. It's no pun much. intended with the slap right. in the face. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I do feel like it did add another layer to it. And especially with the quote of, well, would it be different if it was a black woman? And she's like, no, it's, it, I need you to be black. It's because right. you're not black, right? And so um, for a while, I think in, in the black community, it has been said that when a black man is successful and he's making good money, that he's going to uh, be with a white woman. So it's always kind of been seen as like a, like a jab to a black woman to have a man that she's with then leave her to be with a white woman. So I, I think it is like this cultural um, message that's also sent in that too. Yeah. And when he get on, he leave your ass for a white girl. Okay. <laughs> like, okay. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And mm. I think that's the context that is being made. I think that is the 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 dynamic of the situation and the commentary that they're making with her calling him Uncle Tom and him just getting yes. to the point of like it's a bit redundant. So he's not negating the fact that I'm not an Uncle Tom. That's not who I am. He's just like you keep saying it. It's okay. We we understand that now. Next mm. point. <laughs> and uh -huh. so with him getting the white woman, it just confirms that uh, of him who he sees himself as how he shows his success because that's something the point that she made too of like oh you about to go show her off to your co-workers and what are they going to think and do that mm -hmm. but I think he's trying to send a different message of I'm at a different level of success mm -hmm. I am where they are I am on par with them uh, and and here's my white woman to show it yeah well even when they were in the office though in that conference room he says the business hasn't been doing well so is it that that the business is going is doing well or was he just like just being an asshole probably both because at this point i don't know if we could trust anything that this fool say because he was hiding properties in a whole nother country you think that's true sir. yeah <laughs> yeah i was like wow I, and, I, and i think uh bernadine's feelings are compounded by the the investment she made in this relationship mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. she's an educated woman who put her career on hold to support her man. I, I think when you put it all together, it doesn't, because if we look at it from a 2023 lens, it does feel, I'm, I'm sure people would say it's problematic that she feels that way and verbalizes it. But mm -hmm. I think in context with what the two of you just said, plus knowing the investment she put into this relationship, I'd be mad too. Like, like I, yeah. I think the film attempts to lessen that blow with the Wesley Snipes character, who we learn has an off-screen white wife dying of cancer. <laughs> did y'all yeah. think that he was casted because of jungle fever <laughs> once i saw that i was like is it the same wife is it the same character <laughs> is annabella shiora is she dying <laughs> yeah is bella shiora dying <laughs> it's a sequel wow huh that's an interesting <laughs> you know courtney tends to do that she makes this like film universe kind of come together like it may not be the same storyline but she finds a way to connect it in this multiverse you're, you're making <laughs> fan fiction i love it <laughs> i love it yes it's so creative it but, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, it she did have a lot invested in this and i think the thing that's heartbreaking for her especially is like I gave, like, she literally gave everything that she had and, like, to sacrifice her, her catering business, um, to have two children. And, yeah, like, it's, it's that was a blow. I've, that, that I've was been blow. dying to say this line from the soundtrack, but she was mm -hmm. his lover and his secretary. <laughs> right, <Remember>? secretary. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have to talk about the soundtrack because it's Ooh. iconic. Yes. And I was a junior in high school when this soundtrack came out <laughs> and um, I did have my little car and I would play <laughs> these songs and I had no 
connection or relationship with romance at that time. Mm -hmm. I had never even kissed a, per a human person of life. So <laughs> I don't know what I thought I was singing about, but I was singing these songs like I had just been left. <laughs> from your soul, from your spirit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's true though, because like, okay, since we're, since we're putting it out there, I was like five. So <laughs> I definitely can say that I was probably singing these songs. Not probably. I was singing these songs acting like I knew what I was singing. I probably didn't even know the words, right? But yes, this this soundtrack is absolutely amazing. So getting back to the iconic scene, Angela's character, she holds it together well enough until she sends the kids off to school. <laughs> and she's looking real good. She has on her little, I don't know what that is, uh, agent provocateur or whatever. She looks really good, smoking her cigarette. Um, and as soon as she sends those kids off, she runs into that man's in amazing walk-in closet and just talks about how he's a psychopath. And <laughs> that was so good. <laughs> that was... Has this garage, the garage sale where she has the sign that says, is, does it say hangover for love? Or hangover? Yeah, everything must go. <laughs> yeah. Did you notice when he tells her, I'm going to go to the party, just not with you, then we get the effect of the emergency broadcast system? I <laughs> yeah. love I that. that was interesting. Yeah. Never picked up on it before, but this time I'm looking around like, oh no, this is definitely coming from the movie. <laughs> right, I was like, what's happening? <laughs> There's about to be a problem. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is the emergency. It's, it's, it's going on in here. <laughs> right, yeah. Because that would be me in my mind. I would just go blank. Like there would be a dude in my mind as I'm processing you telling me that you about to leave me for your secretary but okay so here's a question I have because we were talking about this last night I feel like the fact that he the manner in which he told her this information tells me that he's been disconnected from her for a long time mm -hmm. and he finally broke and do we think that could there have been a better way for him to tell her this versus just saying it and not dragging her to this party. Absolutely. Like, don't okay. wait until so I'm, I'm sitting there. Like, yeah, like, I'm <laughs> nice and good and ready. The only thing I got to put on now is just my dress and take these curlers out. And and you telling me as we're about to, like, leave for an event, like, tell me that while I'm in the shower or something. Like, you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> why would you wait until I'm good and ready to go? <laughs> it it feels I vindictive, yeah. Yeah, and mm -hmm. then like it took mm -hmm. everything in me. I'm like, is she? I wish she would just throw that brush at him the way she had it in her hand. I was like, I would have just right at his head, but you know, we don't. Well, I just gave much. people a glimpse into my true nature because I was <laughs> like, what's wrong with him just telling her? <laughs> but yes, like that's ridiculous. I mean, I guess for for you know for film or movie theatrics or whatever, but yeah, I think he could have found a better time to say it. So it would have been wrong no matter when he said it. You still sure. leaving me for the secretary. <laughs> There's no good time to say what he's saying, but it just <laughs> sense he's angry too. Like he felt good mm -hmm. doing that to her. But yeah. So I need to take a step back for a second because something that I was a little there are I, I think this movie's good. I do think there are some weaknesses, particularly with the screenplay and mm -hmm. one example of that is the relationship between the four friends doesn't, it doesn't feel as organic as I think it should. And mm -hmm. at the end, I'll talk about what I think a better story would have been, but um, so their connection is not quite clear to me. So Loretta Devine, I believe owns her beauty salon. I would assume so mm -hmm. based on her house because she has okay. a beautiful home mm -hmm. and she's a single mom. Uh, so Loretta Devine's a hairstylist and Angela Bassett is one of her longtime customers, 11 years. Mm -hmm. So that's how they know each other. Then I assume Lilo Rashawn knows Loretta through the hair salon as well. Mm -hmm. And then Whitney just knows Angela Bassett. No, so I think that her and character was closest with Lila Rashawn because they're the ones who have the most, like when she's talking on the phone, she's talking to Whitney Houston the most. And when she discloses her abortion, it's just her and Whitney. So it seems like their characters have some intimacy as well as um, Whitney and Angela Bassett. See, those moments you're citing confused me because I thought they didn't know each other. <laughs> so the fact that they were talking on the phone so much was confusing. But mm -hmm. we can assume that they are close. But the film doesn't establish that very well. No. Well, no. So that confused me. 
It technically uh, opens with Whitney driving to Phoenix. Like she's just uprooted her life again. And she's going to where all these women that she knows are already located. Yeah. Yes. I, mean, I only took it as she knew Angela, but. Hmm. I agree. Like, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure of how they know each other, but it doesn't feel, um, yeah, it doesn't feel like like the 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 line the stories like connected in a way that says this is our friendship. You know, it's just like each individual person having their thing, and then they kind of overlap with just coming together, talking about it, supporting each other through it. Um, it kind of reminds me of, like waiting to exhale feels like um, insecure was birthed from waiting to exhale. Ooh. like you know like that kind of new age that's the type of image that or storyline that i would see happening if it were to come out again in 2023 <clears throat> i think a good point to make too is forrest whitaker directed this movie mm. it's, it's technically his theatrical debut he'd only directed a tv movie before this very notable actor yeah the fact that it's directed by a man seems really strange to me mm. um mm -hmm. And, may, and maybe that's where some nuance might be lost too. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know there was a sequel written to the book and before Whitney died in 2011, there, were, there was talk of everybody getting back together and Forrest Whitaker directing again. It's just like, I, I don't know. I feel like somebody more appropriate could do something else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought it was interesting that it, um, that it was directed by Forrest Whitaker. But given that it was in 1995, did we have a lot of like, women directors at the time there was julie dash had had the first black woman with a, a film that opened theatrically with daughters of the dust but you know uh, that was a small sundance movie 1991 mm -hmm. she would have been a gamble kathleen collins mm -hmm. was dead already and there, there was use Eugene palsy but she was an american like she directed mm -hmm. it by white season they could have made an effort but yeah uh, what year did eve's bayou come out 97 Oh, so that was way after. Yeah, so that's still wrong. You have Casey Lemons had the staff. I thought the same thing too. Like, mm -hmm. why did Casey Lemons do it? <laughs> mm. Yeah. But so getting back to Angela, I have to talk about the scene where she chops her hair off because I have been in that situation <laughs> where a customer comes in with long hair and they want it cut off. And I'm traumatized because I've done Ooh. it before and the person flipped out flipped out so I really felt like when Loretta says no I'm not doing it like I, I felt that and then when Angela grabs those scissors and just goes <laughs> first of all why are your scissors readily available for your client to snatch <laughs> up okay coming here in crisis and then causing all these all these issues for me it's a safety yeah. hazard <laughs> right. that's contraband for sure <laughs> I thought about you as I watched it because I was like, is he going to talk about how, how she started cutting the hair? Because like the just way anyway. she started chopping it randomly. Fine. Well, I'm assuming, yeah, it looks weird, but I'm assuming they did that so they wouldn't cut her natural hair because that's obviously a weave. So I'm assuming mm -hmm. they were very specific. Like, don't you cut Angela's actual hair? Right. <laughs> but no, that was a pretty, pretty powerful moment. And of course, Angela looks amazing with the short hair. Mm -hmm. I didn't like Loretta, it. Loretta uh, was flip floppy. She was, I didn't like it. Yes, I okay. didn't like it. <laughs> you didn't like it. No, I loved her hair. Like in the beginning too. Like I didn't like that. I didn't like the big chop. I actually, yeah, the hair, I think for 95. And so I think it's, in, we'll get to Whitney, but I think it's interesting that Whitney is clearly wearing wigs while mm -hmm. <laughs> she's like, I'm not even going to try to have any natural hair out in this movie. <laughs> not at all. But that, Angela's I feel like was that, a partial. Like you could see where her her started. Whitney's was just full wig and like <laughs> she looks so cute. I love the Whitney wigs. No, she looks amazing. She really does. We'll that. talk about her acting, but she looks great. Yeah. Honey, because she just knew she could act. She wanted to be all up in the films. <laughs> <laughs> So at Loretta's birthday party, this is towards the end of the film. Mm -hmm. Um it kind of goes left really fast. Like Angela makes it about her and starts crying. Yep. We go call this bitch up. <laughs> right. right. And then it's like, wait, what happened to the music? Girl, we cut it because you was over here having a full meltdown. <laughs> <laughs> but Leela's about it. She's like, give me that phone, I'll call her. For real though. She was she was pissed from jump. Like, he left you with those two keys. 
<laughs> she was I do think nut. it's funny. I do think it's funny how Angela's kind of shady with uh, Loretta's character because she tells her, I'm not like you. I need someone to hold me. Like, right? damn. That <laughs> ball game? Thanks. <laughs> okay. So the issue with Angela is like now that her husband's leaving her, she's concerned about money because she doesn't have a job and they have sort of a situational uh what is it called spousal support situation where she's only getting three thousand a month but the mortgage is five thousand but i thought angela's lawyer was kind of because right when she first meets her she says hey he did everything in his name so you're out of luck i don't know what we can mm -hmm. do for you mm -hmm. that seemed weird to me and then in the end when she gets her this huge settlement all i could think is like your lawyer i don't know how good she was that she didn't realize <laughs> that you had a case but i guess it worked out in the end <laughs> i don't know how but it did yeah maybe arizona law is a little bit different maybe sure. it's a little bit it's structured so that that support isn't as easily <laughs> obtainable she, up. she got like one point some million plus like another half million in stocks and bonds mm -hmm. plus like two houses two, two and, houses. A, and a win and a false oh uh, no uh uh station wagon a mercedes station wagon yeah. Which we need to talk about because in the end, aren't the, they what, in that station wagon at the end? They're in that station wagon, and then they just pull over on the side of the road and start a bonfire. Like what? Weird. Yeah. Like, where Where did you I get to go to the club? Okay, let's start a fire. <laughs> <laughs> Is that okay. what we do in Arizona? <laughs> you're on the rocks. You're on the sticks. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Where did they get that stuff? What did right. you think? What did you think of the letter Wesley wrote Angela? Mm. Right. I thought it was corny. <laughs> it was I thought so he was corny. bold. Like you bold. <laughs> he, only, he only spent one evening with her and he said he loves he her. He loved her. Yeah. But he said it, I love you in a way that doesn't interfere with how I love my wife. Because when my wife sleeps, I cry. Like, uh, I know. <laughs> Am I a terrible human for laughing at that? I don't know. No. <laughs> well, you know, no. Terry, Terry McMillan get married a gay man, so I don't know. Oh, it did happen. It did, In yeah. real life. In real life. <laughs> that plot line is in this movie, too. With uh, Giancarlo yes. Esposito. We're not on that character yet, but that... That was something. I know, I didn't want to jump into but it. Here let's, <laughs> here, let's move to Whitney. Oh, wait, can I do, oh. can I do one last, I had a poem to read. Oh, oh let me well, see. This this let me see. Go ahead. <laughs> From uh, Warson Shire's Bless the Daughter Raised by a Voice in Her Head, which is a really good collection of poetry if you haven't read it, but it's called- um, And Andrew for people Johnson. who don't know, this poet, uh, Beyonce features her work in Lemonade. Yes, yeah, she does. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, it's called Angela Bassett, Burning It All Down. Mm. Is short. That year, the wives in my family packed secret suitcases. I had the front door, fumbled with lighter fluid. One stabbed her man in the groin, said the look of disbelief in his eyes made it worth it. Bitches hysteria, the men called it. Natural response, the women named it. Mother did not snap. Instead, she stretched, watching yeast ferment. Instead, she busied herself with the process of preserving meat. For years, I've watched from the corner of my eye, willing her to burn it all down. Thank you. I love that. that. <laughs> I love that. And I think I think it's it's very fitting too. And I think that the 90s was very much so a time when women were first starting that, like, yo, the patriarchy, fuck all that shit. We don't like it. We yeah. want to do things a little bit differently. And so we get these type of movies, we get these films, and then it, it going forward where it felt like there was a lot of backlash that happened with like, oh, the male bashing that's happening in this film. But it was really black women stepping into a place of their own and existing with happy finding that happiness within them within themselves. And so I think that that poem was like spot on, finger snaps, finger snaps, mm -hmm. finger snaps. <laughs> I thought it spoke well to the moment that that represented with Angela Bassett. But yeah. Burn it all down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So Whitney Houston plays a character named Savannah, and mm -hmm. there's so much going on with her character because she's moving to pursue her career, but in an effort to do so, she takes a demotion. She has an overbearing mother played by Starletta Dupuy from uh, True to the Game. True to the Game, she one, two, and three. <laughs> That's a good man, Savannah. A good oh. man. A good man. 
<laughs> who's he's cheating married. on his wife. Who's yes. cheating on his wife. He's just in a bad situation. <laughs> Married with two children is a bad situation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but can we just, yeah. I feel bad for saying this because it's Whitney, but in the opening, we see Whitney adding, because the film takes place over the course of a year because we go from yes. New Year's Eve to New Year's Eve. Mm -hmm. So when we meet Whitney, she go, she attends a New Year's Eve party on her own. And she's saying that she uh, wants to dance until she sweats. And I thought that was funny because Whitney's known for sweating like immediately. <laughs> It'll be, be fast dance then, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I thought it was more of a nod to I want to dance with somebody. I want to feel the heat with somebody. <laughs> oh, wow. You're, you're less shady than I am. Okay. <laughs> when she goes and sits down and those ladies are just mean right. and kind of raggedy. Right. I was like, especially the one at the head, like, oh, no, not the head. <laughs> that forehead was like, oh. <laughs> that whole party. I was so mad at Kenya Moore for dragging her raggedy tail over there to ruin Savannah's exhale. Right. Kenya Moore hair care. <laughs> but I was making, I was making lunch at that part and I was like, oh, out of the corner of my eye, I'm like, is that Natalie Cole? Because <laughs> she looked Yeah, Nick thought Kenya was Natalie Cole. <laughs> really? I was not. Out of the corner of my eye, she looked a little like her in that movie. I I never realized how big of a cameo or like just random person that is inserted into a movie as much as Kenya Moore. A, yeah. a movie, a show, especially in the 90s, like she has like this whole list of like Martin, Fresh Prince, all these different sitcoms and movies that she just has these little little tidbit little two and then most of them she was a raggedy heifer she did yeah. not have Ooh. to come and ruin savannah's moment uh, exhale like that she did Lionel could have finished dancing first you could have let that man finish dancing yeah. Yeah. you did not really have to walk could. up right then she really could. <laughs> he's like but, um, i'm next on your dance card <laughs> like relax girl we got all night hey, shout out to kenya moore because kenya moore hair cares in like 3,000 Sally Beauty Supply stores and what? other retailers. So good for her. Get your money, girl. Yeah, hey. good for her. But okay, I want to know about this relationship with her mother, Savannah's relationship. Mm. I'm, I'm sure you agree that it seems inappropriate. And mm -hmm. like, how could someone like her set boundaries with her mother? My goodness. That was a, that was an uncomfortable conversation that she had especially when she's in the office and like pretty much tells her well why don't you marry him or why don't you right. fuck him <laughs> and I was like ooh, ooh, talk to your mama like that but um it, it does give a little bit of like dependency you know um I think it's also like it what I can kind of gather from it they have a really close relationship um she is giving like only child vibes so, you know, maybe that's why there's also this level of like overbearing and wanting to be so involved because she has no one else. Like she only has Savannah, you know, and so that's what she's really interested in, but more so her love life, which was really interesting. I'm not entirely sure how we would work through that. Like, you know, as far as like a therapist being her therapist, like how I would work with that, um, unless it's a presenting problem for her. Pick me, tag me. <laughs> You're it. Go. <laughs> it is it's giving very much enmeshed. It's giving um, like you said before, just the 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 lack thereof with boundaries. But to me, I'm also seeing very much a um a misalignment of values and how we're talking about like the differences of generations where Savannah's mother's generation is very much you need a man in order to be able to take care of you and every woman needs a man and because she she even says I don't want you to be like me and not have anyone where she feels like she's incomplete because she doesn't have a male relationship in her life and so she financially she's not able to provide for herself it's just that generational differences and where values lie between that time and she's trying to impose that upon Savannah where Savannah and as much already much more so I'm already a successful woman I have friends I have these things going for myself I'm fine whoever comes on after that is is the plus and I need you to accept that and so here's here's how we're going to do things going forward and so she does a good job of establishing that it just took for her to get pushed to that place of like okay no more I'm not doing that anymore and so I think that for them very much so they could as long as Savannah doesn't fall back into the normal pattern and allow her mother to keep doing the things that she was doing before 
she's starting the good place of establishing the boundaries, what she's willing to tolerate, what she's not, where she can overlook things and where she wants to draw the line as far as her mother being over involved. But it's, it's very much so just those, I see in those generational differences as far as like what options that were available to women, how they see themselves in relationships, what is what feels safe and secure and what doesn't. And I, I was uh, very much so triggered that Savannah kept saying like, I'm 33, like that, that's not that old, but okay, okay, Savannah. I know, because I'm 33 <laughs> this year, like, <laughs> well i have two things to say um but first i think another important detail with their relationship is the uh mention of savannah's mom's uh food stamps because it made mm. me think that savannah also feels financially responsible for her mother mm -hmm. and i kind of relate in some ways to this relationship where it's like you're trying to mother me but then i also am kind of responsible for you so i'm kind of doing some parenting and it just mm -hmm. yeah it it's difficult because I got the sense that she respects her mother, minus that final conversation at work. <laughs> and to me, that wasn't, it wasn't, I don't respect you less. It's that I need respect too. Sure. Right. right. I, I think And that, if I'm uh, paying your bills, girl, I need respect. Because right? <laughs> no. I'm not sending it now that you don't piss me off. <laughs> But keep playing around, mess around. You'd be eating well, off fifty seven dollars a month. Okay. Especially in ninety five, because I probably had to like what like send her a money order or Western Union. Like it takes like, a Western Union. <laughs> right. You had to pay when you send money back then. They didn't even have cash out. <laughs> Speaking of age, um, and get and the dynamic of the friends, I kind of felt like so when Whitney said she was thirty three, I had to look up everyone's ages. So Whitney was thirty two in ninety five. Angela was 37, Lila was 31, and Loretta was 46. And yeah, I I think that lends to sort of the odd dynamic of these four friends. Mm -hmm. They they just don't seem like they would be friendly in that way. I don't know. To be fair, we only we only really get them all together very infrequently. There's the time they go out to the bar, and of course mm -hmm. the end in the birthday party, but they're not really they're not really that connected. And I, I don't think the film is even really trying to sell that per se. Mm, right. Yeah. Was I That's the only true. one was I would was I the only one uncomfortable watching Whitney having sex? Oh my god. Punching on her. <laughs> Grunting. I was uncomfortable with everyone's just unsatisfying sex that they were receiving. I was like, I hate this for all of them. Why can no one be satisfied? <laughs> well, we are definitely, we'll get to Leela. Don't worry. Oh my God. <laughs> right. Because that sex scene, geez. Talk about, I see that being the comedy part of this movie. This is yeah. comedy drama. <laughs> but to, to the point, like as far as like Whitney Houston and her mom as well, um, I think that they did a very good job capturing like what it means to to be a black woman and the the difference the multifaceted types of things that we have to deal with on a day to day and you know being family being one of them and then when you when you're having to be responsible you you become the matriarch of your family um what it means to be that financially even when when you're still your your parents child you're still now having to pay for them and and you know cover their needs uh financially sometimes even as as a child um and then also just just the 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 message overall that it was sending and saying okay I'm I may be your child but I'm also a woman and this is what I need from you in order to feel respected right um it it just it really did a great job and then even going to the age of the different women in this friend group I, I have a variety. I know Courtney does too, like a variety of of women in different ages. And you just you just kind of go off of a vibe. And I felt like they vibed very well. And if, if you look at it, like when they went to the club, like everybody had their own way of wanting to be uh -huh. involved in the club scene. And then even how they celebrated, um, you know, um, what is her name? Gosh, yeah. Gloria, Gloria's, Gloria's birthday. Um, that's me again. I always be screwing up people's names, child. Um, <laughs> even how they celebrated Gloria's birthday, they just got drunk at home and ate a cake. Like that's that was everything for them, you know. And it's just like depends on you know whose vibe it is, but they catered to each other very well. It seemed that does make sense because Gloria definitely said, "Shoot, I could have stayed home and watched Good Times." I right, know, that's did. right. <laughs> 
Shout out to Janet Jackson on Good Times. Yeah. <laughs> we saw her. We saw her in concert last night. Ooh, um, was it everything? Good. Yeah. yeah. Well, I love her so much. I don't know that she could yeah. do, it. but that lady is fifty-seven and she can still bust those moves. She's a little more economical with it, like she's not a hundred percent, but of the time. But when mm -hmm. she does do it, it's at a hundred percent. But what you said last night, like I would still be on a high. I still would be like. <laughs> I saw Janet Jackson last night. <laughs> I think we, we were counting earlier. I think I've, this is like my 25th time seeing her in concert. <laughs> wow. I love that. For I'm you. old. So I, <laughs> my first Janet concert was in 1990. Um, but getting back to Whitney, so her character's arc uh, is not as profound, right? Because we just see her move to Phoenix. Mm -hmm. She definitely, so she does have a relationship with. Uh, Dennis Haysbert, yes, yeah. who is married. He, that's the man who her mother is trying to set her up with. But ultimately, all state man. Yeah. All state, yeah. And <laughs> ultimately, Whitney decides that she needs more from him than, you know, what he's offering her, which is this, this lying, cheating man. Mm. So that's how the story ends for her, that she's just going to move on without him. Mm. I, I think that's one of the weakest parts of the film is when she reads him. Uh, mm -hmm. when they meet for drinks at the end because I, I felt like I needed that to feel a different way and a little bit more powerful for her because it just I don't know well, maybe that's a function of Whitney's acting maybe I don't know Ooh. maybe I love Whitney I gave it... <laughs> sure I gave it to Savannah's char just character in general because if you are passive in your relationships with your parents, you aren't very like boisterous and stand up and make the moves in your friend group. So you aren't going to be that way in your relationships either. And so it if that is how that that might have been the best read she had. That might have been oh, the the what she had to give, and then she spilled a drink in his lap. That might have been her <laughs> her going That's for the really, gold. Yeah, <laughs> she needed to really say something. Thing. Man using her toothbrush, but. Ooh. she sure did <laughs> she's like well, he's working my last nerve it's like you need to say don't you can't use my tell you still let him smash come in straight and smash no foreplay <laughs> no kiss no nothing, no, nothing. just come sh straight into it after you are upset that he used your toothbrush and he used your toothbrush and he chain smokes weed and you Ooh. don't even smoke all Ooh. right girl stand up say something i'm go huh. so i'm it, proud it she might did. not seem like a lot of, of boundaries were set and things earth shattered for her but at the end the fact that she said anything i was i was glad because you let a man just come straight use your toothbrush after knowing you for a couple days and then just climb on top of you no <laughs> No, well, nothing. Uh, no, no wooing. No, nothing. He ain't even spit started. Just he was nothing. Hunched. hunched. Just hunched. <laughs> I, I've done hey, more for less. See if it was awake or nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Lastly, I thought it was very funny that in the final scene when they're driving, Whitney's character refers to the movie Tootsie as Tookie. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's move on to Loretta Devine's character, Gloria. So we know, yes. so her life, she has this beautiful home. She's a single mother. Her son is played by Donald Faison. Same year he did Clueless. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad he went bought for Clueless. The hairline, can we talk about his hairline in this Ooh. film and how he was young he was and how it was already dissipating? I'm so happy that they shaved his head for Clueless. This makes but, absolutely no sense. This poor young man in this male pattern baldness. Ooh. Well, yeah. but you know what? <laughs> He's very lucky because even looking at him in 2023, he looks the same. Like he he's, does. He's yeah. aged very well. Mm -hmm. yeah. but, so Loretta has been raising her son as a single mom. The dad mm -hmm. is not really in the picture. We get the sense that maybe the dad like visits once a year to see the son. But the but the big gag is that the, the dad is a homosexual. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I thought the scene where he tells her that was, it. it I, I felt so bad for her because she really wanted something from him. And mm -hmm. you can tell that he's just like, oh, girl. Like well, <laughs> That's Giancarlo Esposito. And it, it's clear that he has had time to think about this because he, he says something like, you know, I always been by. And she's like, what? What? Right. Like, I didn't and know that. Yeah, you know that, ma'am. Because <laughs> he said, I've been bisexual for years. <laughs> like, you should, we duh. <laughs> Poor thing. Yeah. And then when she's like, 
he's like well you know how i didn't respond to you she's like yeah well i thought it's because i put on weight out that broke my heart i was like yeah yeah i felt so bad for her yeah like she just and then if i'm getting this right like she hadn't had sex in what 10 years because they they called her out and said like she didn't have sex for 10 years or in her 10-year drought or something like that yeah yeah, seven years something like that but it was a significant amount of time yeah i'd be doggone y'all clown me like that on my birthday now i can say something back Somebody would have got a face of cake or something. Y'all not just gonna call me out on my birthday. <laughs> or if you if you are gonna call me out, then call somebody in, honey. Right. <laughs> right. Bring somebody over okay. in my drought. Yes, that's what I want for my birthday. My first Thank thought you. about my first thought about her character is I want to taste her cooking. First of all, those portions when she's serving. Oh, yeah. I thought the three scoops. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. So, you know, just some leftovers, collard greens, cornbread, candy, <laughs> yams, little potato, salad, fried chicken, peach cobbler, a few slices of ham. Oh, you know the peach cobbler is good too. And then oh. was she, so, so she has a neighbor, Gregory Hines. I thought that yeah. seems fun. I mean, that's iconic, yeah. especially when she mm-hmm. says, I hope he's not looking. And then yes. <laughs> but, um, and then of course the line you just said about her offering some leftovers, but, um, Gregory Hines is a widower mm-hmm. and she invites him over for dinner. The scene where he says, cause she goes, I should, probably shouldn't be eating that as big as I am. And he says, well, my late wife was a big woman. <laughs> right. I was like, is that uh-huh. okay? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> First of all, the red divine isn't big. Right. So right. let's big, skip yeah. there. You're not, yeah, yeah. she's not big. So the, the, the connotation, she was very mean towards herself. And I didn't like that self-deprecation. It was kind of, uh, because she, that there, are you, I just didn't like it. She was, she's not big. But, but, that's, <laughs> but that's the case for so many women. I mean, I think that's just the case for everybody now, because we're all so self-conscious of our weight and our size that we may not see that person as being bigger or obese but they may feel that and then that's real for them and so I think that again is just playing up on the struggles that women have with their with their self-acceptance and self-esteem um and she was just really struggling because the one man that she's really trying to get at re- literally does not want her and that's so heartbreaking like I had this child with you what do you mean you don't want me yeah yeah, yeah. but she- he didn't want you back then when you had right. a child. For, okay, you, you know what? I mean, I'm, I'm a stop. True. <laughs> that's true. Because, you you got know, me. it's so interesting because it seems like a like someone like her, that character. There's a disconnect. Like she doesn't. Because I look at her ex husband, and it seems like he clearly moved on and found what works for him, and she's still still stuck. Like she doesn't know how to venture out, and that's why she hasn't had sex in so long, and mm-hmm. she seems lonely. She seems a little too involved in her son's life because she mm-hmm. wants him to stay home versus go off to college and go on a like study abroad trip. So. I really felt for her because on the other end, she is an entrepreneur. Like she has a successful business. She Mm -hmm. clearly can project manage and do all the things, but then in her own life. She reminded me kind of a a lot of the characters she plays in for colored girls, where she's either going to let her son or Gregory Hines walk away with all her stuff is the sense sense I get. Yeah. But she's good at playing that kind of a woman. She's very, uh, she, she's good at being vulnerable and gentle. And I, I think anytime you watch Loretta Divine, she's extremely empathetic. And motherly. It's yeah. just, yeah. She just gives you that feeling of, oh, I just want to lay on your bosom. Thank you. <laughs> I do want to talk about her blowing out her birthday cake. She spit all over that. All cake. up on that cake. <laughs> I thought, you know, like it would have been funny if someone said, girl, you had to spit on the cake. <laughs> I, I was waiting for that. <laughs> That was not even a, a I red berry. The cake. <laughs> well, at minimum, I would have been like, y'all gonna need to cut me a piece before she keeps spitting on this cake. <laughs> Take the frosting off my slice. She Somebody scraping off the frosting. <laughs> yeah, scrape off all the frosting. <laughs> oh. Um, I I like the scene where she is commiserating with Gregory Hines' character as if he's going to agree with her regarding her son. Mm-hmm. And he's like, I think you're the problem. Mm. I thought that was very well done. And then she gets mad. Like <laughs> I think Gregory Hines is probably the best male character. Yes. Mm-hmm. Well, let's talk about that because 
three of them, so three of the women are in relationships with men who are not available. And mm -hmm. then we have two other characters, Wesley Snipes and Gregory Hines, who are a, a widower and a soon to be widower. What do we think, like, do you feel like those three male characters play into this notion? Courtney, you already mentioned about like these man hating stories from the nineties. Do you think mm -hmm. this is the source of that critique? Mm -hmm. I don't think it's the source. Um, <laughs> I think uh, the the color purple much more so set a foundation for that a little bit earlier on, and then it can continue to build from that as far as like cinema goes. But I think that um, there were so many. It was I would felt bad for the women of like why is everyone okay being in relationships with men that are married. And then, then they get to a place where at the birthday party, we're like, oh, they're either married or they're mm -hmm. behind bars or they, or they are gay or they just in some way they are unavailable to the women. I think that there was a, that in that moment, it's almost like they're the true victims in the situation of larger circumstances that are happening for black couples and black love th throughout the that time and unfortunately there are we have statistics that show that uh black women aren't getting married at certain uh ratios as other groups of people are but there are still large numbers of black families that exist statistically as well and so it's kind of i guess the i was i was a little disappointed i was like why is everybody going after mary men but yeah. then they were saying like, well, this scene and where we are, it's not a singles place. We're in Phoenix. Like when where they were at the bar, they were like, yeah, no, this is it. This is this is what we have to choose from. And I think it was an exaggeration of like saying that dating is trash, which dating has always been trash and it probably always will be trash. But <laughs> I think that <laughs> I think that it was just uh, uh, making it hit home for how difficult it is to find a partner when you are looking for someone within a certain tax bracket in a certain city that doesn't have a lot of black singles and you're trying to navigate these circumstances when unfortunately there are a lot of black men that are imprisoned there are ones that are already in committed relationships there are you're not meeting the the people that you're looking for and i think i did a terrible job of getting to the point it took me a long time to get there so i hope it all no. makes sense as we yeah. arrived <laughs> you did great you did wonderful <laughs> well and then going back to what an extra slap in the face it is then when they leave for a white woman the one mm -hmm. available one mm -hmm. um this book was actually or this film was actually brought up in a publication called is marriage for white people how the african-american marriage decline affects everyone mm. um which is a 2011 publication i have not read but uh that's all I think an interesting part of the conversation about what's depicted here about what's available to these black ladies in Phoenix <laughs> yeah it makes me this is just like again it's like this uh this theatrical way of, of of telling the truth of highlighting the truth and the unfortunate reality of it is is that most black women got a reason to be pissed and if it's not because of health disparities or what you know uh wage gaps is because we can't even find a decent person to partner with and then when we do we got to deal with the bull so you know it it really is an unfortunate reality for a lot of people and I guess this was just a really interesting way of of showcasing that in a talent uh, in in a comedy drama film well, to wrap up Loretta's character, it seems like she does have a happy ending because Gregory Hines tells her he loves her. Yeah. And her son. Gloria to love Gloria, though. I feel like it's not officially going to be happy until Gloria just feels better about herself. And I hope that she doesn't need Gregory Hines. I can't remember what his character name was, but I hope she don't need Gregory Hines to love her in order for her to love herself. I hope she's able to find that at some point as well. So if even if they work out beautiful, I love that for them. They are a super cute couple. He's very uh, good for her and her son. And that's wonderful. I just also want her to love herself a little bit more too, because she's very much so deserving of that. And it, it has so much to offer to herself, the world world to the people around her and everything yeah well lastly we have Leela Rashawn playing Robin oh Robin <laughs> she's yeah. so she's sexy she's raggedy so bitch <laughs> she's so sexy raggedy. she's raggedy <laughs> she's raggedy <laughs> okay so we meet her and she says my weakness is pretty boys with big sticks 
So this is my impression of her. Mm -hmm. Wendell Pierce. I oh, don't gosh. understand why she is hooking up with a subordinate mm. who has no game. Mm -mm. You already know the dick is trash, like on site. I don't know. I, can someone help me understand why she hooked up with Wendell Pierce's character? <laughs> I don't understand. The, but d does it make sense for her character? I've been it doing doesn't. the same thing and getting the same results. Let me try and do something different and see oh. if something different gives me something different. And so I think it was her trying to do something different. Go with a safe choice. Someone who's trying to offer stability, do something different. And it just won't where it was at. <laughs> I mean, the, yeah. Her. <laughs> the conversation they have post coitus, I think is the kind of where that scene is going. And in, mm -hmm. in that. And, and I think that is also a motif in the film that's condensed in that conversation is this, I can give you what you need. What do you mm -hmm. need? I'll just talk about what people's needs are, but nobody's giving anybody what they need, really. Mm -mm. No one's giving themselves what they need, <laughs> let alone anyone else. <laughs> that's true. So Lila, that <laughs> oh, so sorry. So Lila's character, she has a sort of a generic professional position. Not sure what she does exactly, but she's in a relationship with three different men. So one of her subordinates, then um, Cynthia Bailey's baby daddy, Leon Robinson, he's in the movie, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Russell, and mm -hmm. he ain't shit. He's, he has a, no. he, the scene where at the end when he goes to hook up with her and it's clear that he just finished having sex with his main woman, Mm. that's why he and wants to wear tells a her <gasps> to but tell her don't uh you should tell your boyfriends don't call here after 11 p.m you just uh, coming from your wife house oh oh before, <laughs> he he said, before he says that line he says i can't come here and be pressured about what i do with my wife right <laughs> you need to leave sir, right now okay and take your pajamas with you right <laughs> <laughs> and you at least he probably has his own toothbrush true <laughs> then she's then she's in a relationship with the other guy who takes her to a party where he's snorting cocaine. McKelty oh, Williams. honey, McKelty Williams. I actually thought he seemed like a nice guy. He just what? Like, like you know, like he to stole hang, her wallet. Well, to hang out with, you know what I mean. <laughs> Get high with, yeah. We're if loving was, in the summer. You raggedy bitch. <laughs> When he threw after, the oranges at her, <laughs> after throw that years, up here. <laughs> don't you throw that up here? <laughs> you know, I like that scene because it's playing the Romeo and Juliet theme, where she's oh, yeah. from the balcony, and it's totally the perverse uh, opposite of that, which is really interesting. Also, his uh, McKelty, uh, I you had to tell me that he's Bubba Gump from Forrest Gump. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I'm the only one who didn't know that. <laughs> no, you're not alone. I had no okay. idea. You didn't know that? Yeah. No. <laughs> that man has lived, okay? He has done a world of movies. <laughs> wow, wow. He looks familiar. I like But him. Robin's but, character yeah. gave me like, these are the lies that we tell ourselves. Because she was, she very much so was lying to herself. She because swearing up and down that Russell was going to leave. We knew Russell won't leave in that woman. Then she was, oh, maybe I could be a good influence on the dude doing coke and I can change him. No, girl, yo, you giving him some booty is not going to make him change his life. Just right. It was just all of just the lies that we tell ourselves to, to, to feel good. She just... Uh. <laughs> so Leela's character, we find out in the end that she's pregnant with Russell's baby and her intention is to keep it and raise it without his assistance. So I hope that works well for her. That's just it'll so be a beautiful baby. <laughs> yeah. 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 I'm like, okay, so you made the other dude put on a condom, but you didn't wear the condom with him because that's the main. You just yeah, because in her mind, that's her man. Duh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's all trash, but. Did, did you like how Whitney had to tell uh, Lila Roshan about McKelty? Like, you know what he does, right? Right. Doing like, drugs. yeah. Because she is lying to that. herself. Girl, you just told me this man do drugs a second ago. <laughs> I believe Whitney added that to the script. She's like, let me do something. <laughs> okay, I thought I, it was interesting that he really wanted her to come to this family barbecue. 
like why like where did is that even a thing like people invite people over to show their their love like you only know me for two two days like Isn't there, there's a scene in insecure about a barbecue that was pretty significant i thought was it in the first season? I'm I'm kind of forgetting the details now, but that that there's similar pressure put on somebody, and and they just the character disappears for a long time and embarrasses them. Is yes, that, is it Nathan? Are you talking about Nathan? That sounds right. Yes, yeah, he goes and gets high instead. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, I mean it's definitely a red flag. Like I've only known you for seventy hours, and you want to introduce me to your mother at a barbecue and your son. And, and your 13 year old son who I didn't know about. Right. I <laughs> well, I've only known you for hours, so I guess it's fair. <laughs> oh, can we talk about her that fiends do? <laughs> <laughs> fiends. Um, okay. I know that we're running out of time, but Wait, I did... her apartment. Leela's Leela's apartment is bizarre to me. Why? With the dolls? Because she has like a well <laughs> like really she has like what appears to be a really good career mm-hmm. and then wants to live in her goal is to live in Scottsdale, which is something else to unpack. But uh what I don't know, her apartment just seems like I guess it's a typical just single lady that doesn't care apartment, but I don't know. It just seems like she should have something more immaculate to me. But I also felt that way as someone who's articulating that she wants a more stable life. And Scottsdale is known as like the more like premier suburb of Phoenix. Like she clearly has a certain taste. It, it mm-hmm. seemed odd to me that, and then she has subordinates. I would assume she makes a good living, um, that her home didn't reflect that. So, so I reach and make stuff up on our show. And so in my mind, she, uh, she has bad credit. Huh. And so she's paying down some things. <laughs> she's, you know, she's stacked she up co- some stuff. She co-signed, she co-signed on a car mm-hmm. for some dude. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, the one she had to get the abortion for. Yep, he ran her credit into the yeah. ground, and she's just trying to rebuild now. Mm-hmm. That is absolutely yes. what happened. There we yeah. go. Yeah, there we go. That's it. I just glad we closed things. that for everyone. Yeah, I have a few more things. So, does anyone besides me remember DJ Theo from ninety two point three The Beat? That was a Los Angeles radio station. So, I think only LA people might know, but he was—he's the person narrating the movie. Oh, I know. Well, he was a very. Oh, when he uh, talks about your resolutions that you're not going to keep and all the things that you're not going to do, the weight you're not going to lose. I said, oh, how negative. This is exactly where I want to start my year. <laughs> he was very popular in the 90s. And I'm from LA, so I remember him very well. And he was on a lot of shows like uh, Moesha and uh, like other urban films. But oh. the gag was um, DJ Theo was Asian. But back then, because we didn't have social media, you didn't know what people looked like, and it's the radio. So I remember when he went on Moesha and everyone saw that he's an Asian dude with, you know, floppy hair, but he has vanished. So this is just me calling out to you. If anyone knows where DJ Theo is, please let me know. Um, Drop it in the comments. (laughs) At DJ Theo in the comments. (laughs) Something else I wanted to get a perspective from the two of you about is it seems like sex, like these women's relationship to sex is like a major theme in this movie that I feel is just kind of like dropped and like just like thoughts on like how sex is. Because I feel in some aspects, it's kind of a progressive look at sex with these women, but then we're also not really delving into their needs. We just see sex as kind of like a joke. Mm. It seems like the 90s was the first time when film was like, oh yeah, women enjoy sex as well. And so maybe maybe we should talk about it from their perspective, but they should not be satisfied. Uh, So it was was the first step to get us to, (laughs) the sex can also be pleasurable for us. We have to first enjoy it. So I think the 90s was was the first step in that progression of that. Oh yes, we we desire it as well, but it's not always pleasurable for us. That's not, that's not the point of sex, I guess. And, And in film land until further on. <laughs> Cause it was giving me, it made me think about uh, Nate humping on Jada Pinkett and set it off. It was mm. just like, oh, I hate it when women are just forced in movies to like, they're lying there as things are being done to them as opposed uh, to having or- a sexual experience. This feels mm. ugh, painful. <laughs> Indeed. Yes. It just, yeah, there was no appeal to it. I was waiting for them to all exhale. Like I was holding my breath. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. During the sex scenes, like yeah. this is so uncomfortable. Man. I need to double when Leela was like, ooh, yeah, ooh, <laughs> uh, ooh yeah. 
when Whitney and Dennis are having lunch at that outdoor seating area, did you notice that they had like a basket of crudite? Yeah. Have you ever, like instead of a bread basket, it was raw vegetables. Have you ever had a meal where they served you raw vegetables in a basket? <laughs> I it thought maybe that's how they go to Arizona. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's desert. Something. You got to make sure you take your veggies in. You know, you got to <laughs> stay regular. <laughs> that bothered me a lot. Um, I did not notice. And now I'm going to go watch it again yeah. just to look at the What bothered me basket. was his trifling tale. Sir, your kid got uh, the, the chicken pox and the flu and, uh, and is, is, is hyperventilating and shit. And you up here, the key kid with me. This is, down with alcohol. this is how COVID spread. You when know, he you said that I was like, whoa. Like, <laughs> Back up. Back now when he has shingles, like what? You gave me. <laughs> Listen, he just had the wrong response today. He was so annoyed. Like, how dare she call me? Just rub it, rub him in a hot bath and rub some alcohol on him. <laughs> so, I'm gonna, so I'm going to spring this on you because I didn't tell you this before, but uh, so we rate movies on a scale of uh, 0.5 to 5. So 0.5 being the worst and 5 being a masterpiece. <laughs> so I'll let you two think about it for a second. Nick, what would you give this movie? Uh, three. I would give it three out of five. I do think it's good. I do think it loses steam once a Angela meets Wesley. I feel like it, mm. it does slow down a bit, but I, I think for the time and what it meant and to see these four amazing women in a film and for it to be successful. There's a lot tied into it that I think is definitely worth a watch if you haven't seen it. And then do, do either of you Same. have So I'm going to go 3.2 just because of, like you said, the cultural impact. It just did a lot for my family at that time. I remember my grandmother having the book and uh, like all of that. I remember the full week of Oprah when the movie dropped, she had them on and it was a whole thing. So I know that it's like my best friend's favorite movie. It's just, it, it, con it continuously comes up. I reference, that's a good man, Savannah, in regular conversation. So I think what it did for me culturally gives it the extra point two but i think that it is it is a good it's it's a it's a decent film is it great no and as much as i hate to say that about uh predominantly black casted films especially black directed but it, it it also didn't age well i think that's the biggest thing for me too is that it did not age well now watching it again i'm like mm, mm. <laughs> it ate better than how stella got her group back i will <laughs> I, I, I do like this film more than how Stella got her group back. Yeah. Dr. B. Yeah. It's still fun to watch though, but yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I would say a tree, man. It's it's not, it's a three. It's a good three. Um I think that it would get more for simply just being a fact that it is a a black, um, a black star production. But yeah, I just Looking at it again, especially as an adult, it's like, yeah, there's some things that are, are still missing for me. I need a little more here. I wish there was a better storyline with this here. But otherwise, good movie, great actor, uh, acting, um, a three. Bomb nice. soundtrack, though. <laughs> Bomb soundtrack. Yeah. Yes. 3.3 3 if we add the soundtrack. <laughs> yeah. If you haven't listened to the soundtrack, I highly recommend it. All of the songs are written and produced by Babyface, except for one, which is a classic song, but um, or a cover. I yeah, like so Whitney, there are two number one like pop hits on there. Uh Whitney's song Shoop and then uh mm -hmm. Tony Braxton's Let It Flow. Mm -hmm. But you have Brandy on there, uh Mary J. Blige, Shaka yes. Khan uh aretha franklin it's such an impressive shantae moore shout out mm -hmm. to shantae moore uh but with that high that's where that was my first time hearing her just do that high pitched run and i was that's not her whistling that's not a that's not a <laughs> a sound machine that's her oh okay <laughs> maybe maybe face just did um one of those like tabletop concerts and uh that was amazing i recommend that shantae moore looks and sounds amazing but mm -hmm. This has been amazing. Uh, I'm going to put links to the Diagnosing Sitcoms and Movies podcast in the description, along with the video we did with the two of you. This has been a pleasure. Yes. Again, again, fun times. Thank you for having us. All right. Thank Bye. You. Bye.